First of all, I want to say it's such a, a pleasure to be here today. This really bookends uh, a lot of experience I've had um, with the National Center, as some uh, may know. Uh, 11 years ago, I partnered with a small uh, intelligent visionary team and uh, was able to uh, write a grant to the National Science Foundation and, and found uh, the center. And it has been uh, a pleasure to watch it uh, grow uh, and evolve uh, over the last uh, decade plus. And some of the smartest things I ever did was to recruit Steve Harrington uh, to the team and to hire George Walters, Colleen Molko, Valerie Piper, and Charles Henkels, a lot of the voices you've you've heard today. Um, I want to uh, dive right in with the topic that they, they gave me today, the future of work, trends, and careers in technical education. And I want to start off uh, this morning by talking about uh, work and career trends. I'm going to start right close to, to the topic we're talking about today, supply chain automation technicians, and then back up. You know, I want to, I want to conclude this symposium this year by taking some, some steps back about what's really happening in the macro lens of this field. Now, as a lot of you know, e-commerce um, is, is booming, and it continues to have a trend line that preceded the pandemic, but then spiked uh, just in the last year. Um, e-commerce is the fastest growing segment of the retail sector. And of course that has a lot of implications uh, for this field, for the employers and for our students. Just last year alone, we saw it spike uh, as a percentage of retail at 45% and, and, and that was only in, in Q2. So we know we're gonna see some more spikes in that from the fall data. And we know year over year change, even looking before pre-COVID, e-commerce was dramatically expanding. Uh, the, the, the sector and, and the influence and the need uh, for more automated warehouse facilities and the technicians they're in. So, so when you look at just the square feet demand and how much extra warehouse space is desired, I want to thank Steve Harrington for, for these slides. It's 175 million square feet needed annually. So, so whenever I'm talking locally about the need for this program and the need for technicians, I just have to, to look at e-commerce and the space utilization needs and people get it right away. And they understand the connection that's happening between our habits, uh, our Amazon Prime memberships, and then the need for this program to not only be established, but that to then be expanded. Now taking back a, a step further away from just supply chain automations, but, but about uh, technology infusion more generally, uh, a recent study by Oxford University found that almost half of all jobs are likely to be eliminated in the next couple of decades by technology. More uh, recently than that, the University of Redlands put out a study based off of uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, founding that 56% of current jobs now through 2036 in the United States can be uh, um, automatable. Now, a lot of people then see these types of studies and they, they jump to, well, then wait a minute, the sky is falling. You know, and they ask in which jobs will automation replace humans. And that is, it is such a, a well-intended but, but false question to ask. And whenever I get asked that as a proponent of this space and, and as an educator, um, currently a vice president at a community college, um, in, in the classroom, um, part-time, it used to be full-time, and, and by, by trying to address this space, here's the example or the, the parable that I tell, and it's a familiar one that many of you are, are, are uh, you know, familiar with and have heard of, and it's the parable of the ATM adoption, right? When we look back in the 1970s and 80s, you know, we look at ATMs that people said the same thing. The sky is falling. We're going to eliminate the, all the tellers in the banking industry. Well, we can see from the data what actually happened. 1985, there were 60,000 ATMs and 485 bank tellers. And everyone was afraid that the, the expansion of the technology would eliminate all of those jobs. Fast forward to 2002, the number of ATMs grew to 352,000. The bank tellers also grew. But in addition to that, there is this financial advisor sector that grew. Fast forward to 2017, 470,000 ATMs, slight reduction in bank tellers, but exponential growth in the financial advisor segment of the financial industry. If you look in red there at the net growth of employees, it continued to accelerate and grow. The sector did not fall upon itself. It wasn't a house of cards. The same is to be true for the e-commerce effect and the automated uh, warehousing effect on supply chain technicians and on AI and automation in general. It is not going to replace humans, but it is going to shift the need and the demand for the human beings and the skilled talent that we need. And I found this analogy and this parable to be imperative to me as I explain to others in my community and, and even some naysayers of, of, of the, the laggards about technology advancement about why this is not going to hurt or crush jobs, but in fact, elevate it. And it's very clear when you walk into a bank and you compare the way they worked there, the way they looked rather than working out of just exclusively tellers to now where they have all these comfortable open spaces and there's financial planning and interest and mortgage loans and other dialogues going on about investment. 
The same is obviously true for our, our space. And, and, and I hope that that helps to, to think about a trend that is happening and explaining it to those uh, in your environment. And what I like to do is take a step back and look at the nature of work itself, which used to be these three ribbons that went across the screen. The world of work used to be education and then career, and then you retired. So it used to be you'd have the education that was finite and fixed. You'd be done after your two or four or more degree. You would then enter into a job, have a, have a career. And, and the success measures for education at that point was the placement rate and the starting salary. And then you would eventually uh, retire, get a pension. And with a life expectancy that was only at uh, 67, you know, you'd live for one to five years and then die. Like that, that, was the, that was the way it was designed economically, right? That was the system. Well, that was the nature of work it was then. And instead of thinking about as education, career, and then retirement, the new paradigm, that we're entering into is now learning, leveraging, and longevity. I want to thank and credit uh, Heather McGowan uh, for for this for the slide she talks about in her book. Learning and then is, is going to be obviously throughout our career, and that's why I absolutely love what has been done here with the CTSCA and these stackable certificates that individuals can can learn and then engage on the work site. They can leverage their employment to accelerate their learning, and they're ping ponging and bouncing constantly, leveraging and engaging classroom, online, personal, or facilitated instruction with work based learning experiences, paid or unpaid. Success measures here in this new reality and in our new nature of work is about learning agility and adaptability. And you'll notice with the longer life expectancy, we expect workers to remain engaged, although in different ways, but the learning and the leveraging band is, is uh, continuous throughout our entire lifespan. It's no longer fixed periods of discrete time that's linear in nature. Subsequently to that, then the talent shifts that are required, as, as many of you know, then are, are evolving. We've gone through a number of eras. Our mental models and our educational models are still often very much fixed in the information era, but we're right at this cusp. We're right here on the right side of the screen where we are, are starting to transition into what's being called the augmented era. It's no longer just about acquired knowledge and skills. It's about the creativity, agility, and the adaptability of those skills because of the constant churning uh, that's happening within our employers and within the field. So what I'm observing as a, as a trend um, that's happening in work and careers that we're shifting from that, from, from that paradigm of driving productivity of our workers in the information age to now shifting to inspiring human potential. Because the, the, that interplay between the world of work and the world of learning continued to be juxtaposed. Now, I do believe that there's a lot of trends happening in that world of work and career that obviously affect education and to which we need to respond to. I'm going to break an educator's rule uh, this afternoon. Please bear with me. I'm going to show a couple slides that have way too many words on it, and I'm not going to read the whole things, but I, I want them there because the slides will be shared, and I wanted you to have the full uh, reference. But, but there's also a trend in education happening for the first time in about one and a half generations where parents are starting to not want their kids to go to a four-year college because they see the, the sometimes the, um, the uh, uh, underemployability and the student loan debt that occurs from a degree in philosophy, like what I got, uh, no offense to the fellow philosophers in the room, uh, but then versus the actual employability of technical and, 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 and the industry skills um, that is provided in programs such as this. So, so I'll read here just the, the, the section I highlighted in red. They found that 46% of parents said they would prefer not to send their children to a four-year college right after high school, even if there were no obstacles financial or otherwise. That, that margin, the last sentence there is a slim majority of parents, only 54% are still um, preferring that four-year college option directly after high school graduation. There was another national survey of teens, I'll write, read just the colored, 52% uh, percent believe they can succeed in a career with post-secondary education other than a four-year degree. And a quarter of high schoolers, the highest in, in recent trends, say that they are more likely to attend a career in technical education school due to the pandemic. There is no doubt that the last 15 months have completely changed the way the youth is thinking about the world of work and, and leveraging college and post-secondary options after 12th grade. And they're expanding that to look at programs uh, like what we're talking about today. And I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, organize my slides or have a pre-meeting with Charles Henkels, but he basically said the exact same thing earlier this morning in talking about the, the great relationship with the launch initiative uh, and target. And that is that education to a job is no longer linear. And looking for the trend I see is that instead of going to college to get a job, that's a traditional mind frame, students will increasingly be going to a job like at Target or Amateur or others to get a college degree. We are going to see this trend where employees are going to start to say, hey, yes, we offer a salary and medical and dental and a 401k contribution and college tuition. 
And we're going to see that being more ubiquitous as part of this philosophy called job first and college included. And, and that is going to interplay with that work-based learning approach and, and the learning and, and the desire to connect education and the employer site with more fervor and intentionality. Here in red, I highlighted 74% of all parents of K through 12 students would consider a route where their child would be hired directly at a high school by an employer that offers a college degree while working. See, now as an educator, sometimes we're recruiting students to our course, to our program, to our school, to our division. Instead, what we should be doing is what Charles Henkels and, and Phil Jones talked about this morning. It's actually recruiting them into a profession, an entry level job, and then in braiding that with the opportunity to go on and get further education. And a lot of these uh, employers like those at the bottom of the screen are already doing this. And so I think we're going to see this be a broader trend in, in the next the two to 10 years um, that is going to require uh, more stronger partnerships like what we're hearing about today. In the past, we learned in order to work. And the trend I foreshadow in the future is that we will work in order to continuously learn. And, and that's a mind shift, especially for our parents and for some of our students to realize school is not just something you do and you check a box and you get done, right? The college is not, is not this fixed thing. There, I, I just read from Brandon, uh, Brandon Busteed uh, in Forbes, the, the gentleman I quoted in the previous slide. He just put out on LinkedIn this last week a, a, a study that showed that nearly half of everything an undergraduate learns their freshman year is outdated by their senior year. And so this just speaks to that need for constant stackable credentials and certifications, even outside of the traditional Bell schedule. Now, don't misperceive me. Uh, don't get me wrong. Formal education is still imperative. We still need to teach students how to read and write and have applied math and all these things. But what I have learned and what the research bears is that that formal education is insufficient when it is unapplied or disconnected. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir with this slide. I know you know this. I know many of us are on this type of a, of a webinar because we know that education counts, but that adaptable skills count more. And that's why the, the skills boss and being able to get that in, in a bunch of different locations and modalities is so important to increase access and success for our students to get out of the educational trajectory and into gainful employment as soon as possible. So let's shift that a little bit more and talk um, for a few minutes about technical education trends um, more narrowly, as I know that's what, uh, from yesterday's poll, uh, about 74% or so of those in the symposium are come from this trend. So let me, let me talk about this for a minute. Now, some of you are very familiar with an S-curve. You're familiar with this, uh, this industry concept about a product and market life cycle, where you have a startup, you enter rapid growth, a product reaches maturity, it plateaus, and then most likely there's a, a decline. And you might have seen that multiple S curves when stacked together uh, really indicate these trends and these waves of technological innovation. Well, what's interesting about this is this isn't just for cell phones. It isn't just for, for te computers or technology or software. It's also for our curriculum. It's also for our programs where we have early adoption of a program. We have the growth. We create our lesson plans. We spend a lot of time doing day comes, as just mentioned. And then there's this innovation window when that technology starts to change and we've got to start this new S curve. And so I am so encouraged, uh, frankly, to hear the dialogue about all the new things coming, coming on board because what, what the trend that I've observed and what we all, I think, feel and, and know is happening is that technology-based curriculum must respond to these S-curves and keep riding the top of that wave with partners like Amitrol and MSSC and others because our curriculum has a lifespan. We know this. Our lesson plans have a lifespan. And so I just want to uh, acknowledge, you know, you heard about this previously in the symposium, but I acknowledge and thank the team um, at the National Center for putting out the, the iBook and making it available in multiple formats and, and refreshing it and updating it even this year and continuing to make it in, engaging. And especially in COVID, something that can be done um, asynchronously and on their own uh, to, to continue to learn and refine their understanding of this field. Now, because of COVID and related to that, to that iBook, I wanted to share some research um, that I conducted uh, late last summer um, that's relevant to talking about trends in technical education. The counties of Los Angeles and Orange County, um, you know, reached out to me last summer to help them identify um, some research on how they can convert 12 of their, what they called hard to convert uh, career education programs and, and identify how can they transfer them into a distance learning uh, environment where in California we had a completely, uh, you know, shut down. There's, there's zero hybrid for some time. And, and the really question was, how do you do remote skill verification 
in this modality. So I, I have a, a, a report, you feel free to dive into it if you want more than just this cursory overview, but um, it does identify the technology solutions and opportunities for successful online conversion. Let me just share with you a little bit about what's inside here. We did an internal scan, of course. Uh, we surveyed uh, 28 Los Angeles and Orange County community colleges, 57 CTE faculty and deans responded about what they had already done in the spring and leading into summer of 2020 in response to the pandemic. We did an external scan as well, primarily focused outside of California. I mean, we completed 40 interviews across 13 states. Um, and, and I was asked how many different uh, links and references were in there. So I actually counted, there are 228 uh, citations, references and links so that when you download this, it, it, you know, it's a bunny trail of, of awesomeness uh, that you can go into of all of the different vendors um, and, and platforms and, and tools that are already available for the space. But let me let me just give you the takeaways, right? Let me give you the the elevator speech of of all this work. It's over you know over fifty pages of of research. But what's the bottom takeaways? Here, here they are. First, most in this country that are leading technical education programs are planning long term for the new normal. Many of our leadership, many states, they're planning for pandemic 2.0. They think uh, another uh, pandemic will occur, if not this fall, in the in the near future. They they do not think this is a one and done situation. And why that might be scary to think about, and optimistically, we don't want to pres pre uh, presume that that will be the case. Um, they're planning so that all of our programs in the future can toggle. And at any point in time, we have to be ready to either go into a hybrid or a completely online environment for part or all of a term. And I think that's uh, that's not just going to be a short term solution or band aid. That's going to be a trend I think we're going to continue to see. And so as such, to the second takeaway, the CT instructor role is shifting. What we're seeing now is a lot of opportunities more to leverage curriculum portability, not necessarily being the stage, excuse me, the sage on the stage, but having the curriculum that can be portable across state lines, across the, the district, across, um, you know, even in this case, across disciplines, sharing course content through Canvas shells, like mentioned earlier today, be it Blackboard or Canvas or, or other, other uh, learning management systems, taking entire modules and, and not reinventing the wheel. In California alone, we have over 960 unified school districts. And there's an introduction of business class being taught at every single one of those. And we have 960 instructors that are reinventing the wheel every day instead of sharing that into a common uh, learning management system and having that course portability. What the National Center is doing so effectively is helping uh, those of you that are in, in classroom instructors just to jump higher and run faster by helping you to create the lesson plans and the shells Thirdly, to adopt national certification curriculum as discussed uh, today in perfect alignment with the national research as the, the CTSCA is demonstrating, and then to expand the classroom walls to include the employer location. If, you, if, I, if I can take you back 12 months ago, there were so many programs across the country um, that were forced. I, I remember a, a culinary arts program in Idaho that was forced, you know, that school sites closed down. The soup kitchens in the community became the laboratory for the culinary arts, uh, you know, program out of, out of necessity. And now, thankfully, a lot of instructors are maintaining that relationship to have that relevant work-based learning. And the same is true as demonstrated again this morning with, with Target uh, and Norco College and the launch curriculum. We have to expand the, the, our cognitive thought process of our walls to include the employer. The previous gentleman was talking about space being the hardest constraint. Well, it, you don't have to fit on one building, right? We, the glory is we get to partner with other employers and our classroom can be where they're being employed as well. The third main takeaway is embedding those simulations. Not everything has to be done on-site supervised. But the next trend is to uh, really embed augmented reality and virtual reality within our CTE programs. And that is exponentially growing and it is proving to be very effective. In fact, I even have here, I, uh, my friends at ZSpace, they sent me uh, you know, the hardware. And so I got the demo here. I have my, my ZSpace uh, VR glasses. And, and they're, they're so effective that there are some programs that I know we as educators thought, oh, you can never do it you know, through AR or VR, like welding. For example, it's like, well, you've got to burn rod. You can't just do welding, you know, completely virtually, right? Well, maybe. Uh, North Dakota, they just finished a study where they had a couple different groups going on. Some were 100% on ground, some were uh, completely online, which is a proctored final exam. The industry pass rates were the same. Some of the technology in that case, the Lincoln Electric uh, virtual training modules was so good that it was a very short learning curve from practicing it in their bedroom to then actually going on the site uh, and, and burning rod in person. And so I think we are going to see, uh, I predict, that in the next 10 years, every single CT program will have AR and VR embedded within it. And whether it's ZSpace or, or virtual labs or, or companies like, um, like Transfer VR or, or, or MindShift, there, there's going to be so many opportunities coming up like EON. There's so many vendors that are coming out with this now. That's going to be the next S-curve 
for us to adopt is to get this curriculum now into an AR VR environment. So with an Oculus Rift goggles, we can increase access to the field, especially in places that may, maybe won't have a full training lab or an employer in their community, but they can still enter into this field. And then lastly, it's important to note a, a core takeaway is that there's no silver bullet to this. There's um, a, an, an opportunity to get a core suite of tools and programs. It's what I affectionately call the CTE Swiss Army Knife. I encourage uh, faculty either regionally or across a discipline like this nationally to get together and identify the two to five tools, the two to five training programs, the two to five simulation toolkits, and then having economies of scale, driving and adopting that curriculum and the advancement of it forward. So we're riding those S curves, not reinventing the wheel of, of curriculum portability and, and lesson plan creation, and just adopting that Swiss Army Knife for the field and for the program. And, and again, that's what I've seen this center do so effectively over the years is to convene and provide those opportunities for us to, to learn and leverage so that that new faculty is not reinventing the wheel um, every time. So if that article is, is helpful to you and that research, feel free to download that. It's also, uh, it was written up just uh, two months ago in Techniques Magazine, which is the publication of ACTE. I'll give them a shameless plug uh, if you're not a member of the Association of Korean Technical Education. And if you're not already getting the Techniques Magazine, I'd encourage you to, to do so for 80 bucks a year. It's worth, uh, it's worth the membership even at a out of pocket as I pay for mine. What I've come to see as a trend in, in work, in career, uh, and in career technical education is that education is often organized, unfortunately, by courses that are focused on graduation. But what if education was organized around learners focused on fulfilling their potential? And what fields like supply chain automation do is for the first time in a long time, it helps to put in clarity for our, our students and for our learners their their purpose, their profession, their education, and, and it's able to all be in line so that for the first time they can put the, the pedagogy and their professional attainment um, in the same space. And so if I were king of the world, uh, which my wife likes to remind me, I'm not, uh, if I were king of the world, work-based learning for like 250 hours would be required for every high school graduate. Every high school graduate should get at least one industry certification uh, before they graduate from high school to ensure true uh, work-based learning and career uh, readiness. And we would really be focusing on galvanizing the individual's potential for work, not just preparing them for, for one job, and certainly not just focusing on commencement and pretending that that is a goal. Graduation is a milestone, but it's not the end destination. Being viably employed in a living wage, in a field that they contribute as they can provide for their family and their community, to continuously learn and grow and adapt and involve and leverage work to continue to move to that next stair step occupation for them and for their, their company. That is what all this is really about. And I know many of you are doing that day in and day out. So I really wanna end just with that encouragement and by saying thank you for those that are focused beyond graduation, beyond just the course and helping your students propel into this growing, emerging, high growth, high demand industry that is having a, uh, as we know, not just a resurgence now because of COVID, but a bright future because e-commerce is certainly not gonna slow down uh, just as we start to return to quote unquote, uh, the new normal. Uh, so with that, I know I, my rate of speech was fast. I had a lot of slides and content I want to get through in the, in the short period of time I was afforded, but I, I think we had uh, a few minutes that we've carved out for questions. And, and again, I just want to say to the team, to the National Center uh, team, kudos uh, for all the industry partners uh, that, that have been alongside the journey and helping to co-create. Thank you. Uh, and for the opportunity of hundreds of supply chain technicians nationally that are being pumped out every semester. Uh, thank each of you for what you're doing on this call and for what I know you will do in the next year to two as a result uh, of this symposium and this convening. So thank you for the time. And with that, uh, Mary, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over uh, to you and, and uh, we'll, we'll address any Q and A's that might have. I haven't been watching the chat. I couldn't do both. Uh, so I'll, I'll lean on you. No problem. Um, thank you for that, Kevin. That was tremendously inspiring on top of being data driven, which are just, you know, the two best things. Um, we did have a couple questions, not in the chat, but they came a little in, in a separate channel. And one of them I think is is really pertinent to what you were just saying. And and beyond the technical skills, um, what else should today's learners be focusing on acquiring to learn uh, to kind of aim them in their careers? What would you suggest for that? Great question. So um, I've, I've read a lot and written a lot on that. And I think there's four skills that all students need, uh, regardless of who they are, where they're going. So all students need academic skills. They need to be able to read, write, understand, synthesize, apply, and, and then teach someone else. So they have to understand that basic reading, writing, and, and applied math. They need the, the academic skills. Secondly, as human beings, uh, our students are not getting oftentimes from public education life skills. 
And that's everything from, you know, proper nutrition to financial management and, and financial computer literacy, but also, you know, goal setting, uh, interpersonal management, grit. Um, so so there's, there's a life skills component. Third is employability skills, um, how to get the job, but then more importantly, how to keep the job, how to do those pivots in, in career, how to evolve and, and enhance in one's career, how to gain mentorships, how to conduct informational interviews. And all three of those skills, academic life skills and employability skills are not industry specific. It's the fourth skill, technical skills, is the only one of those four that's really industry or occupational specific um, that will continue to constantly change or, or focus in. And, and again, if I were king of the world, Mary, and I could rewrite the high school uh, you know, curriculum, um, it would focus on, on all of those, uh, which has, that, of course, that underpinning of, of critical thinking and being a good citizen. Um, but I think we're missing the mark a little bit, and I think we've gotten a little myopic um, in public education in America, K through 16, in the way that we've identified courses uh, that should be required instead of broadening that view a little bit. Good question. I would agree 100%. I've, I've done a lot of DACOMs and that type of exploration, and I'm telling you, Seriously, those are the skills that employers over and over and over those 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 what they call the soft skills, which I think is a misnomer um, is a misnomer. Uh, right. We really do miss the mark on that. We don't necessarily produce work ready graduates um, skilled, maybe, but not necessarily work ready. So I would agree with you. Absolutely. Um, another question came in. Um, what do you think will happen to the value of a college degree in the future? You know, with all of these different sources of learning and, you know, we continue to kind of see more of this uptick on putting together your own kind of like learning path, what, what would you predict for that? Yes, this is a dicey question to answer as a college <laughs> vice president. So I have to, I have to choose my words carefully, right? But um, <laughs> I, I, I'm concerned for our field uh, in higher education because I, I think as you see in every industry, um, not just in, in, in technical uh, you know, programs like this, but you see um, Google coming out their own certifications. You have Kaiser hospitals coming out with their own certifications for the healthcare field. The only thing that is really holding back the water is this dam called accreditation. And as soon as these private players get uh, accredited for um, in the same way that the college are accredited, I, I think public education is in trouble. Um, I think it's still very antiquated. And, and we still have at Norco College in Southern California, half of my classrooms have sled desks just like the 1950s, not much has changed except for our current technical education classrooms. And, and I think we still look at education based off of uh, a factory manufactured date, i.e. my birth date, and that, that determines the sequence and the process of school as opposed to looking at aptitudes and abilities. There's no reason why high school in America shouldn't just be fixed around competency-based education when someone's done, they're done. Why is 12 years this magical, fictitious number that we hold on to? And don't get me started on the Carnegie unit and, and where that came from and, and how we should get rid of it, Mary. But, but I, I do think that industry credentials are going to um, eclipse uh, the value of, of a degree in the next few years. And we're seeing it. Um, a lot of articles now are coming out about liberal arts institutions, embedding industry credentials into their uh, baccalaureate degrees, um, acknowledging that that is what's going to give their students uh, a degree of competitiveness. And I couldn't agree more. I, I, I'm a, a firm believer that uh, braiding together a strong liberal arts curriculum, a strong general education uh, core, uh, which, which could be modified, of course, but then with industry credentials and third party verified industry credentials that actually matter to industry, that's how students are going to get a competitive advantage. And when I advise my students locally, I tell them, yes, the degree may be required, but it is insufficient. And I'm pushing them to get those credentials. And so I think we have a, a small window of opportunity in that, in that S curve. We're in that innovation sphere where us in, in post-secondary education need to adapt or, or we may find ourselves um, in dire strengths uh, due to low enrollment in the years to come. Well, you know, you look at your previous answer and you look at this answer and there's a map. You know, there's definitely, there's definitely, you could overlay one over the other, whichever you wanted to. I mean, the, when you're talking about that skill set, that is something I think that the colleges can offer, that more broad skill set. But I think that, yes, I think it's time to get on it and, and start driving that, start driving that car before it gets driven for us, I suppose. For those That's of right. And, yeah, and, and not, pre not pretending that we're the answer to everything, yeah. right? I mean, we have to have enough humility and wisdom to acknowledge that students need more than what they can get in our three unit class. And they need more than what they can get, you know, from 7.30 to 2.30. And that parents and community and internships and co-ops and mentorships have to be part of this equation to really fulfill them as three dimensional human beings. And we need to re-engage, honestly, the community and the parents in, in the education of our youth. Um, I, I think we've um, 
pretended that we had a luxury to relegate that responsibility to education for far too long. And so I am just elated that in this sector and others, employers are, are coming to the table and, and aren't just giving lip service, but are true embedded partners in the classroom with us because that's what it's gonna take. I would agree hundred percent. I'm gonna ask just one last question, even though we're a little over time. Um, there's a question in the chat. Are there any models that are helping to map competency-based certifications with the time-limited course structures that exist? Yes, um, and, and California is nascent in that. So don't look to, to us yet as the model that we're starting that conversation. Uh, the American Council on Education, ACE, is, is really the, the gold standard for this. They have already uh, mapped credentials from the military, where there's military uh, certifications from the DD214, all the way to industry credentials, and they've mapped those with higher education courses. Um, I, actually, Norco College is working on a, on a pilot project for the state uh, to start giving competency-based education credit for those that are coming to us with work experience or military experience or just real life credentialing experience so they can get college credit for that. Um, again, assuming that college credit is somehow more valuable. Uh, that's that's a different conversation over a glass of wine. Um, but but I, ACE is definitely the, the gold standard to look at. I know North Carolina and Virginia have done a lot of great work in that space as well. Uh, but I think that the takeaway is that we, we cannot in this space be so beholden to the, the Carnegie unit of 54 hours of lecture equals three you know, credits on a transcript. And we cannot ignore the deep value that our residents can get either on their own in entrepreneurial settings, starting their own business or working for an employer, getting real hands-on work-based learning. And we really have to be more intentional about how we give that academic uh, credit and, and verify the skills that are sought outside of our walls and, and, and not be so... Um, Got to be careful here, Mary. There's educational elitism is alive and well, uh, but we have to be humble uh, enough and wise enough to recognize that we uh, there's a lot we can do, uh, but there's a lot learners can gain outside of our ivory towel uh, walls as well. Well, you know, when you make the locus of, of the whole conversation about student success and about getting that workforce pipeline really functioning as well as we can, um, everything you're saying just resonates so, so soundly. So thank you, Kevin.